I'm so pleased to welcome my friend Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen to the Newberry this evening. Jennifer is the Merle Curdy Associate Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin Madison. She earned her PhD in history at Brandeis University and her BA from the University of Rochester. Prior to landing in Madison, Jennifer taught at the University of Miami in the history department where we were colleagues not so many years ago. Uh, Jennifer's book, American Nietzsche, A History of an Icon and His Ideas, was just published by the University of Chicago Press. In the book, Jennifer examines how Nietzsche's philosophy found a home in America. Nietzsche's writings about the death of God and the challenge to universal truth have inspired American thinkers. Journalists, academics, philosophers, theologians, poets, and others have drawn on Nietzsche for inspiration, we learn, in American Nietzsche. American Nietzsche already has been reviewed widely and positively. New York Times book review editor Alexander Starr wrote, Today's inescapable and perplexing Nietzsche is not necessarily the same Nietzsche who inspired readers in the past, and it's the achievement of Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen's American Nietzsche to show how that is the case. Starr's correct to praise Jennifer's ability to help her readers think more deeply and more historically about Nietzsche and American intellectuals than we might have in the past. It's one of the great successes of her book. In a compelling prologue to American Nietzsche, Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen recounts Nietzsche's fervent reading of Ralph Waldo Emerson, beginning in the 1860s. She writes, it was Emerson who first instructed Nietzsche about philosophy in life. Nietzsche was powerfully drawn to Emerson, Jennifer explains, because he understood what it meant to travel imaginatively through time and space in order to find a thinker to think with. I know a few individuals who travel through time and space as imaginative as imaginatively, or who are as compelling thinkers to think with as Jennifer herself. So we're all in for a real treat this evening, thinking with her. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen to the Newberry. Thank you, Danny, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Newberry Library and A.C. McClurg Bookstore for hosting tonight's event. And thank you all, of course, for coming out tonight. All right. So it is very fitting that I find myself in Chicago talking about Nietzsche, because it was in Chicago in the early 90s, during my gap years between undergraduate and graduate school, that I began to read his philosophy. I knew I wanted to go on to do graduate work in US intellectual history, but like many people interested in ideas, I was nevertheless drawn to European thinkers, Karl Marx, Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, Sigmund Freud, and Nietzsche, most especially Nietzsche. After I moved on to graduate school, I continued to find Nietzsche's thought pretty intoxicating, and I felt a little sheepish about my attraction to it. After all, I had gone to graduate school to study American intellectual and cultural history. And so I felt compelled to turn back to my American thinkers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller, W.E.B. Du Bois, John Dewey, Reinhold Niebuhr. I thought it was time for me to find myself back on American intellectual native grounds. But in my effort to put Nietzsche to the side, I came to discover how difficult that was going to be in contemporary American intellectual life, especially in the American Academy. In higher education, Nietzsche's philosophy figured prominently in scholarly monographs, journals, and university courses in all fields of the humanities and the social sciences. There wasn't a university library uh, or major bookstore that didn't have a Nietzsche section. But even as I widened out from the intellectual world of the academy, I was repeatedly foiled in my efforts to move away from Nietzsche and move back to my America. Even the most casual survey of American culture at the time made it unmistakable that this 19th century German philosopher was a towering public intellectual in contemporary American life. He was everywhere. Images of his furrowed brow and imposing mustache were on our coffee cups and our t-shirts. His, his aphorisms were on our bumper stickers and our tote bags. His phrases, his concepts like will to power, slave and master morality, ubermensch, resentment, were studying our morning papers and our advertisements. Nietzsche could be found in contemporary novels from Tom Wolfe to Scott Turow, as well as our te te television shows and movies, including The Simpsons, Conan the Barbarian, Blazing Saddles, A Fish Called Wanda, Clueless, 
and I couldn't resist putting a few uh, recent uh, shows on, and that includes The Sopranos, The Day After Tomorrow, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and Little Miss Sunshine. Nietzsche even made it to Off-Broadway in Richard Foreman's 2000 Bad Boy Nietzsche. Along the way, I would come to discover that Nietzsche had inspired some food, including Ben Hillman's Nietzsche Pops. There is a Nietzsche Will to, Bow Will to Power Bar, which is the official nutritional supplement of the Superman. And for those of you who are weak will to powered, like myself, and eat too many of them, there's even a Nietzschean diet, uh, as advertised in The Onion in the mid-2000s. New diet lets you eat whatever you fear most. <laughs> and we even have a plush 11-inch Nietzsche doll to snuggle with at night. So there was this quirky, harmless figure of our material culture, but of course, we know there's also the menacing teenage Rambo Nietzsche as well. Right in the early years of the project, 16-year-old Luke Woodham of Pearl, Mississippi, exemplified the figure of the angry, disaffected young man who brandished a Nietzsche text in one hand and a gun or knife in the other. And this, of course, became con quite conventional as we moved throughout the 1990s and into 2000 with the 1999 Columbine High School massacre the 2001 brutal du double homicide of a husband and wife, Dartmouth College uh, professors in their home, and more recently, the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and 18 bystanders at a meet and greet in an Arizona parking lot last January. Trying to move back to American native grounds, move away from Nietzsche, going to politics was a bad idea. I discovered very quickly that Nietzsche's there too. In his address to the Joint Session of Congress on September 20th, 2001, the first major address that President George Bush gave after the 9-11 attacks, he con con condemned the 9-11 terrorists for their vicious will to power. But I came to see that Nietzsche was not simply a figure of the right, but he was also a figure of the left, or the center left, depending on your angle of vision. Of course, it was many years later that I would learn in an October 2008 interview that then-candidate Barack Obama, who was asked by the New York Times about his philosophical and literary influences, would name Friedrich Nietzsche as one of them. He had come into contact with Nietzsche while a student, an undergraduate at Occidental College. I could turn to popular music, and again, Nietzsche was there as an inspiration from performers as diverse as gothic rock singer Marilyn Manson and the folk icon Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell even named her oscillate cat Nietzsche and dedicated her 1998 song Man From Mars to him. Mitchell explained in an interview what Nietzsche, that is the philosopher Nietzsche, not the feline Nietzsche, meant to her. Quote, Nietzsche was a, a hero, especially with Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He gets a bad rap, he's very misunderstood, He's a maker of individuals, and he was a teacher of teachers, end quote. And just in case you think that this was some curious fluke, uh, on your ride home tonight, turn on the radio to a top 40 station, and you will very likely hear Kelly Clarkson's a hit song, Stronger, which the lyrics for Stronger are Nietzsche's maxim, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, uh, and I won't sing it for you. Um, and if kind of light rock is not your fare, you prefer rap, then you can listen for Kanye West's 2007 hit version, also stronger, also using Nietzsche's maxim. So, so let's back up a bit. What was already clear from the outset of the project was that Nietzsche had this dominating presence in 20th century American intellectual and cultural life. And yet it was pretty easy for me at the time to assume that this fascination must have been of a relatively recent vintage. To track it, I thought we, maybe we could do the, look at the psychic and moral dislocations of Americans trying to come to terms with the horrors of the Holocaust and the atomic bomb and the post-World War. I thought maybe it's even more recent than that. Maybe I can trace it to the temper of the 60s when Americans coming of age struggled with the bankrupt ideologies of the Cold War world and bristled against the lingering bourgeois conventions and comstockery of their parents. And yet, in my effort to reclaim my mind for more German, uh, pardon me, more American thinkers, I was foiled yet again as I thought, let me just move back in time and surely this will go away. 
In fact, it didn't take long or much effort before I started to take note of the curious Nietzschean traces in American thought from earlier periods. Indeed, in the very texts I was reading while trying